So anyway, let me welcome you this morning to our um, San Joaquin County Master Food Preservers. We're part of the U University of California Cooperative Extension. And our purpose is to teach safe food handling and safe food preservation. And so today's workshop is going to be about how to use berries and how to preserve berries. And our presenters today, we have Colleen Young, who you can see on the screen, and Diana Wamsa is going to, is going to be, a, be helping out a, in Colleen's kitchen. And my name is Linda Driver, and I've been a master food preserver since um, 2013. So anyway, I think we are ready to go. I'm going to check and make sure, we'll be checking to make sure everybody has their mic um, turned off. I think we have a, Manny, could you turn your mic off, please? And I think we are pretty good. Okay, so, and Maria, could you make sure you have your mic turned off? Okay, um, one of the things that we always ask people to do is make your comments and questions in the chat. And um, I will be monitoring the chat and try to answer um, questions there, but we'll, we will also stop for questions uh, from Colleen as we go. And um, and it's always one of my favorite things to do is to find out where everybody's from. So if you could put in the chat where, where you are located, because it's always interesting to see with Zoom, we get to talk to people halfway around the world. And that's a really neat thing. So I think we're ready to go. Colleen, are you I'm ready? ready? All right. Let me change my view here. There we go. Okay, good morning and I'm glad you've joined us today. We're gonna to talk about berries in particular. Um, after I talk about how to preserve berries, we're going to focus on frozen berries because that's, frozen berries are available year round. And you know, once you've preserved them, I find that freezing them is the best way. So then what are you going to do with them? But before we start that, I'm going to share with you, I have a little PowerPoint and it's just for information for you guys, not um, that I'm going to be using it very much. Okay, share. Okay, so we're going to be preserving berries. So first thing I want to talk about is cleanliness. You want to make sure that you always wash your hands and your surfaces, your cutting boards, any utensils that you're using. You want to make sure that that's clean. We, it's a good idea to sanitize your surfaces with a bleach solution. The best way to do that is to make a, in a quart bottle, squirt bottle, one teaspoon of bleach and a quart of water. After you wipe your surfaces down, and dry them, spray them with your sanitizing spray and let it air dry. Now bleach deteriorates pretty quickly. So you need to make a new bottle of solution every week. Okay, so remember that's one teaspoon of bleach per quart of water and let it air dry. So after you do that, let's talk about ways to get rid of this, I don't want this right now, ways to preserve berries. One of the ways that I've tried and is called dehydrating. So what I do is I just put my berries on a dehydration rack. If you have, um, if you're dehydrating strawberries, blackberries, uh, boysenberries, raspberries, you can just either put them here whole on the rack or strawberries I like to cut in half or in quarter inch slices. They'll dry faster. If you're doing blueberries, you need to blanch them for 30 seconds so that the skins will pop. Berries are not, they're very delicate but a blueberry is, their skin is pretty solid. 
Okay, so once you do that, if you blanch them, you drain them and put them on your, your rack, then you can put them in your dehydrator. If you want more instruction on dehydrating, we have a great um, video on dehydrating and there'll be a link to that a little bit later. I have some dehydrated raspberries for you. Now, this is the first time I've done raspberries and I was very nervous because I wasn't sure that they were dehydrated enough. They're still pliable. They're, they're not very pretty. And, um, but they're dry. I've had them in this container for about two weeks and there's no moisture in there. So then my thought was, what am I going to do with it? And in the dehydrating video that, that uh, one of our colleagues did, she made a powder out of them. So if you're interested in more about that, you can check out her video on YouTube. Dehydrating is not my preferred method. Another thing that you can do with berries is you can can them, which is definitely not my preferred method, but um, you can can them in, in jars. This is berry juice, and I, I do this, but it's frozen. Um, canning is difficult with berries because they're very delicate fruits. You can make syrups out of them, or you can make uh, jams or jellies, that sort of thing. And that works great with berries. But just to can whole berries, it doesn't work very well for me. You may like that. I, I have uh, problems <laughs> with them, and I don't know what to do with them afterwards. OK? But it's, it's pretty simple. You wash your berries. Don't wash your berries before you're going to do something with them. Berries have thin skin. Don't let them sit in water because the berry will absorb the water. And you don't want that to happen because then your berries are going to lose their flavor. So you want to rinse them off maybe a couple of times. You want to let them drain so you get that water off of them before you decide to can them. So then you would put them in with, uh, put them in your jar. And I have, I have a syrup here. You pour the syrup over there and then you can can them that way, okay? But like I said, I, I don't like to do the canning of my berries except for jam. I made this earlier this week and um, one of the reasons I made this was because we're gonna have some very interesting uses for a jar of jam after our, our little video. We're gonna do a video on making strawberry jam. My preferred method is freezing. Um, I'm gonna show you my syrup here. This is frozen, this happens to be blueberry juice, okay? but you can make a syrup after, out of this or, or uh, whatever you can think of. You can find lots of recipes for it. What I like to do is do it on a tray. I put my berries on some wax paper that's on a tray and after they're frozen, I can put those in a bag, like a Ziploc bag or a plastic container, maybe something like this. And I can scoop out as many berries as I need for my recipe or whatever I plan to do with them. This is a mixture of raspberry, uh, blackberries, strawberries, and blueberries. So this is how I like to have them in my freezer. It just makes it easier for me to use them. Now you can also sugar your berries. So you put sugar on them, let them freeze, and then put those in a container. That's another way to freeze them. Um, when I was a young girl, we lived in, in Oregon in a 
out in the country and we were close to a pick your own strawberry field. So we went over there, there was a bunch of teenagers. I had cousins staying with us. We went over and picked a whole bathtub full of strawberries. We took them home, we washed them. My mom sugared them and put them in the freezer and they were supposed to last us for months. I think they lasted a week and a half because they were really good. We could eat them frozen even, uh, or we could eat them as a topping on ice cream or on uh, a cake, something like that. But they didn't last very long with a bunch of teenagers in the house. So if you, if you like to do it that way, maybe you should not tell your family that they're there. Uh, another way is to do them, freeze them in a syrup. And it's just a, a water and sugar mixture. You put your berries in a container. You wanna use a wide mouth container, be it a pint jar or a quart jar or even a plastic container. And you, I think you leave a, an inch headspace because it will, it will expand as it freezes. So if you use a jar with a, a regular top, you run the risk of breaking it because as it expands, it'll push against the sides. So you just make your syrup, you put your berries in there, you add your syrup so that there's an inch from the, the top and you freeze that. It's much faster to freeze them on the tray like I showed you. Um, and you could actually do that and then put them in a container with some syrup that would uh, make the time, make less time for those to freeze. Uh, <clears throat> today we're going to focus on what to do with frozen berries. Um, they're available year round and Diana and I have done a lot of research. We started this last year and frozen berries are cheaper than uh, store-bought. So if you don't have a, a uh, source available to you with either a good price or maybe you're growing your own, then if you buy them in the store, berries seem to be a, one of those fruits that's a little more expensive than, than some other stuff. So the freezing, if you buy them frozen in the store, you not only do you have them year round, you can get them anytime. And if you have them in your freezer, that's even better. Uh, this jam that I made, this is a mixed berry jam, and it was made with frozen berries. So we have another recipe here, and this, these recipes will be included in the handouts that you'll get. This is a chocolate raspberry topping or sauce. Now, we found this very interesting because of the chocolate. Did you want to talk about this, Diana, a little bit? Uh, sure. Um, as Colleen and had, had talked about earlier, we did a lot of research about this workshop uh, before the pandemic. And one of the recipes that we, what really drew our attention was the chocolate. There are not a lot of approved recipes that have chocolate in them. And so we gave this one a try and it was a hit. So it, you're gonna find out later that it's not just for ice cream. So, yeah, it's really good. <laughs> yes, we have expanded um, our jam repertoire. Yes. <laughs> um, because if you're like me, I can't do one batch of jam. And I probably eat more jam myself than anybody I know, except maybe Linda. Uh, <laughs> I, I have toast almost every morning for breakfast. And so I... I have jam and I, I like different kinds of jam. So I want, you know, I'll do my berry, jar of berry, and then I want my jar of apricot, and then I want my jar of plum. So I, I like to mix it up with my types of jam, but I can't do just one batch. I have to do two or three. I can only give out so much. So then what do we do with what's left? That, that can be an issue um, because if I save it for a year, berries are in season again. 
and I'm, I'm ready to do another batch. So what we're going to show you now is a video on how to make a low sugar strawberry jam. Now, before I get into, before I start that, I want to talk a little bit about jams, regular jam, regular sugar and low sugar or no sugar. I have three different kinds of pectin here. Uh, these actually are all the same brand. They're Sure Gel, but there are other brands out there. This is a liquid variety and it comes in, comes in pouches. They're liquidy. This is a low or no sugar and this is a regular. These are powdered and I would show you, but the boxes are empty. They come with recipes. Let me grab this. With lots of different recipes on here. So make sure that you follow the recipe that comes with your box of pectin. Um, if you want a low sugar jam, do not just make reduce the amount of sugar in your jam. Spilled my water there, so I made a nice mess. Did <laughs> you grab the towel? That's good. Thank you, Diana. Um, the sugar is not just for flavor. It is also a preservative. Now, if you want a no sugar jam, the, the no sugar or the low or no sugar also has instructions to make one with uh, a substitute or with no sugar, maybe with a juice or something. So don't just reduce the amount of sugar in your regular or your, your liquid pectins because that is going to, it may not gel correctly and it may not last as long. It's going to deteriorate quicker. I prefer the low sugar but the drawback to using the low sugar, you've reduced the amount of sugar, which reduces the amount of uh, preservative in your jam. So low sugar jam does not have as long a shelf life. Uh, it, it's recommended that you only use it or keep it for a year on the shelf. And the recommendation is three weeks in the refrigerator. And this has to be refrigerated once it's open. The regular recipe has uh, an 18 month uh, shelf life. And when it, after it's opened, you can leave it on the counter. So you have to kind of weigh your preferences here. The uh, liquid is like the regular. So it's got a longer shelf life and you can leave it in, in the counter. Okay. So, um, is there any questions yet, Linda? Everything's okay? All right, so let's, let me power up the strawberry. I'm sorry, I had my mic turned off. I was, oh, okay. busy, I was busy answering a question in the oh, chat. Okay. And maybe I can answer it because they, or, or you can answer it. Um, the person asked, can I make a, can I use chopped up apples as pectin? And I was an trying to answer that that would give you a food that you could refrigerate and treat as a perishable food that you could yes. use, consume quickly. But that's not something that we could guarantee as a shelf stable product that you could have and, and eat for a long time. Right, Ap apples have a lot of natural pectin in them. Uh, pectin is a natural uh, ingredient in, in fruits. Um, if you could find a recipe, a, a researched recipe that has that, you could do that. But it's not something that we could recommend without actually seeing the recipe. Everything that we teach has to be researched it has to be we have we can only recommend it because it's past the research phase and it's proven been proven to be safe because that's that's what we want we want safe preserving for everybody okay 
Any, anything else that you need me to answer? I saw something there about um, boysenberries. Somebody hadn't heard about boysenberries and boysenberries are a hybrid. Uh, raspberries and blackberries, I believe. When, when we first moved in this house, I had a neighbor lived across the street. Her name was Mrs. Crook. She was a little tiny lady, looked a lot like uh, Tweety Bird's grandma. That's how we always referred to her. And they had blue uh, boysenberries and she would pick them and bring them over to me. So that, I, I miss her boysenberries. We had to take them out after she passed away. So, okay, now let me do the, um, the strawberry jam recipe, low sugar. And Linda is going to be our lady for that. Here we go. Where are you? Oops. Needing. Well, I'm going to have to. Oh, let me look here. You were here a minute ago, Linda. Okay. Well, you go ahead and look and Okay. I'll, um, I'll talk about some of the other comments and stuff on the chat. Um, people, somebody's having internet issues and I want to re reassure you that we're recording this and it once it's uh, been processed and everything, it will be up on our website. And I think you get a link to it if you're, if you're in the, if you registered for the class. So mm -hmm. you will be able to see it later. Yeah. And um, okay. Okay. One of the things, yes, I'm, and I'm really glad that somebody whose mom attended classes in, in the 50s and 60s is here because things have changed over time and uh, processes have changed. And I always, I will tell this story while, while Colleen is getting her share screen going. When I became a master food preserver, I learned... You can, you can turn off your mic if you want to, Colleen, and then you okay. and Diana can talk. There you go. Um, when I was, um, when I became a master food preserver, I learned things that made me change my process. And I had been making jam and jelly since I was old enough to stand on a stool and stir, you know, because my mother always made it and my job was standing there and stirring. And way back in those days, um, you didn't stir for a minute at high at a rolling boil. It was three minutes, and in summer in Stockton, three minutes in a hot non-air conditioned kitchen was a long time over a boiling pot. Anyway, among the things that I learned, I used to um, double batches. You know, I was going to be making two or three batches of something, so I would make two at a time because I had room in the pot and everything. Well, I learned that when you do that, you're messing with the chemistry. So I quit doing that. I now only do single batches. So if you make somebody who's been canning for 60 years change their process, there's a good reason for it. Are you ready? Are oh, you ready, ready to go now? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay. All right. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, I don't think the sound is right now. Yeah, I'm going to turn it up. Did you do it through the uh, sound thing that we had on the list? Let me see. Yeah, I, I did. Let me check just to make sure. Sorry oh, no. for that. There we go. I'm sure everybody who's dealt with, with Zoom and technology is understanding. So, Is that better? I don't know. Try again. Use a pot like this one. Yes. Okay. But there today go. I'm going to use this other one because I want to be able to show the rolling boil well on the video. This one will take, I'll have to pay more attention. Okay, so after this, that one, we have. You need a timer. You can time by counting or you can have a one minute timer that you turn. Colleen, through. turn off yes. your mic. When it gets to the bottom. Okay. When we go to process our jam at the end, I think most of you probably have heard of a water bath canner. This is a water bath canner. This is standard kind. Usually they are either aluminum like this one or they are um, enamel with. They, they usually come with a rack that you can set the jars on and then you can immerse them in 
extra water. You can make any font you own that's big enough into a water bath canner. You could make something like this, and then you could put it on the bottom of the pot and set the jars on top of it. What's necessary is to have something that raises the jar off the bottom of the pot so that the water can circulate all the way around the jar and above the jar. I used to use very frequently my spaghetti pot because it came with it built a built-in strainer. So that worked really good. But you can put one of these together and use your soup pot. Other tools that we're going to be using today, I'm going to be working on the strawberries. And you need various ways to smash the strawberries. If you are really strong, you can start off with this one. But I have found this really eases the process a lot. So I smash them with this first and then go to this. I'm going to show you a couple of really neat ways to get rid of the, the green leaves on the top of the strawberry when we get there. Over here we have our pre-measured sugar. One of the things they tell you to do is to always get all of your ingredients out and have them and all your equipment out so that you have it ready to go when you start. That way you don't get to a place and go, oh my goodness, I don't have what I need. So we have our sugar, we have our pectin that has the recipe calls for some sugar to be mixed in with the pectin. We have a little pat of butter, which is going to go into our recipe. We have a jar lifter that is used to lift jars out of hot pans. And we have a handy dandy measuring tool to measure headspace and to get rid of air bubbles in your jar. Um, let's see, we have our strawberries and I'm going to finish making those get ready. Let's see, what else do we have that we need? I think that's it for right now. So I'm going to finish preparing these strawberries. Now, I'll tell you something I learned a long, long time ago. It is really, really important to use fresh strawberries. About 40 years ago, a friend and neighbor who lived across the street and I used to go out to pick your own strawberry places. And we would, one time we both picked our strawberries in rows that were next to each other. And when we got home, I made my strawberry jam right after I got home. She waited till the next day. You could tell the difference. Now, this method here is like way cool. And if you happen to be making strawberry jam with kids, this is fun. Adults have fun with it too. All you do is you take a straw, you position it over the middle of the bottom and push through and the green part comes right off. You can do it with, uh, this is one of the uh, straw than a permanent straw that I have for iced coffee drinks. You can also do it with a regular plastic straw. Just flip, position your straw, push. It comes out in one nice neat little package and you move right along. There's always the traditional paring knife, but you usually get a little more than you want. It's good to have a paring knife around in case you find a bad spot. Don't want to can the bad spot. And I found this at an estate sale a long time ago, and it is a cool little pinch the top off the strawberry. See? Really handy little kitchen tool. Now the reason why I'm saving these the green tops is I have a compost heap. These things are great for the compost heap. You know what I forgot to do? Show washing my hands. I did wash my hands. Master food preservers are big about washing your hands. And I think everybody in the world by now knows that you need to wash your hands for 20 seconds, which is two times through Happy birthday, or the alphabet song, and that will get you to a place where you can consider yourself ready to do the next thing. The um, cleaning my sink and my countertops, I use a combination of one part bleach and ten parts water, and that will sanitize your sink 
and your countertops so that you don't have to worry about bad things growing. My countertops are quartz, which one of the th attributes of quartz is it's supposed to have antimicrobial qualities, which I think is a really good thing. So, we are getting close to the end of the strawberries. These, the variety of strawberries that I'm using today are called Chandler's. And one of the things that I like about them is they are red all the way through. And they taste really good. And the strawberry stand that I get them from picks them every day. And there was a long line of people this morning standing six feet apart with face masks on. Okay, one last strawberry. I have found that going at the strawberries with my pastry blender does a good job of cutting them up and then I finish them off with the potato masher. It's really important to kind of get a consistent uh, mash with your strawberries. If you don't, you'll have more fruit float. The bigger pieces will float to the top and you won't have as consistent a strawberry jam. And I find for me, it's easier if I do it in little bits. This recipe calls for six cups of smashed strawberries which means it takes 12 cups of non-smashed strawberries. Okay, let's see, do we have six cups? Oh, yes, we do. Yeah, we need a couple more. Take our strawberries over here to our pan. One of the benefits of making fresh jam is you get to smell the strawberries as they cook. And they smell really good. Okay, so the recipe calls for a package of the pectin and to be mixed with one quarter cup of the measured amount of sugar. And you put that in when you start. And then if, to keep foaming down as you're... Um, making your jam and foam forms on the top of your jams and jellies, you can put a half a teaspoon of butter or margarine into your pan. It won't change the flavor of the jam or jelly, but it does keep the um, foaming to a minimum. So we turn on the heat and start to stir. There's lots of stirring involved. We're going to have to pay attention because you can see how much the pot fills up with just the strawberries. And to that, we're going to add the rest of the four cups of sugar that go in it. A normal batch would have more sugar than fruit. This is a low sugar jam, so it has less sugar than fruit. And one of the things that Master Food Preservers tell everybody over and over and over again, so much so that I think we say it in our sleep, is follow the recipe. Whatever the recipe tells you to do, follow the recipe. Oh, and by the way, it's a really good idea to read the recipe through before you start. That way you know what kind of things you need to have out and ready to use, and you know what the process is. This, this is a, adding the sugar with the pectin is not something you do with every recipe. And so that is something that you you wouldn't, if you thought you were knew how to do it, you would miss that step. So it's always good to read the recipe and the instructions all the way through. Oh, when while I'm stirring here, I'll go back. I'm sort of disjointed. I talked about a water bath canner. Today, I'm going to use my steam canner. The steam canner works almost the way a water bath does, but 
obviously it doesn't use it doesn't use a water bath. The water is below, it turns into steam. I sterilized these jars earlier today, so they are ready to use. And so when I fill them with jam, I will put them back in here, and then I will turn turn the fire on, and it will, when it comes up to the right temperature, which is shown by the gauge on the top, I will process it for the amount of time that the recipe says, which is 10 minutes. I find I like I wasn't sure about the steam canner, but once I bought one and started using it, I decided I liked it a lot better because one, you only have to use this much water. You fill up to, you fill up to where the, the shelf is that the jars sit on, and so it uses less water. You can use it for anything up to, you can't, the, its limit is 45 minutes on processing time because after that you're going to run out of water. You know, Therefore, you'll run out of steam, and then you'll run out of heat, and so your product won't be safe. So you can use it for anything like um, jams and jellies because they usually process for a very short time. Okay, our pot is beginning to boil. As you can see around the edges, it's starting, and if I stopped stirring, you'd start to see boiling. We're almost there, but not quite, because what we're looking for is a full rolling boil. And the definition of a full rolling boil is one that you cannot stir down. That's what you want. A full rolling boil. You can see how the, how the edges, it's not going down because I'm stirring. So I'm adding the sugar. And this is where the taller pot would be a good idea because I wouldn't have to be quite so careful about stirring. But I wanted to be able to see, I wanted you to be able to see what you're looking for. So now we're stirring in the sugar. And we keep on stirring. I'm going to do this until it starts to boil again and then we will count time. You can see the foam I was talking about on top of the uh, strawberry and sugar mixture. And when we are fi finished, what I do is I usually scrape off, I get the foam over to the edge and get it off with a spoon and put it in the bowl, and that's the first thing that gets eaten. There's nothing wrong with the way it tastes or the nutritional value or anything else. It's just not as pretty. So it took about four minutes, four or five minutes for it to come to a boil the first time. And now we're on a couple of minutes in. I'm going to pay attention to how long it takes to get back to that full rolling boil. Okay, we're getting there. It's starting to, to be boiling on the edges, and that's not boiling down. I want it to be a little more involved before I start counting time. But it's important not to go too long, because if you go too long, you can ruin the set. Okay, I'm calling it a full rolling boil. It turned over the timer. So now I really need to pay attention and stand ready. If it gets too close to the top, I'll be turning down the fire. If you don't have a timer, you can do 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, and so on until you get to 60, and that works too. Okay, we reached our minute. So now I'm going to stir it down a little bit. Okay, I'm going to let it, let it settle, and I'm going to get a big spoon so that I can start scooping up that foam. Like I said, you can leave the foam on and put it in the jar. It doesn't hurt anything. It just doesn't look as pretty. And if you're going to go to all this work, you might as well have pretty. And this will go on my toast tomorrow morning. All right, that's pretty good. Move my pan over where I usually fill my jars. And I have a routine for this. It smells so good. Mm.
oh my goodness, this is a good thing to pay attention to. This jar lost its bottom. Obviously, we're not using that jar. I was going to tell you, I always prepare an extra jar just in case. That was a good thing to do, because obviously I'm going to need it. Because the recipe says it's going to make eight cups, and I prepared nine jars, so it should be okay. This is called a pot filler. It's really helpful because you don't have to carry water across the floor. A lot of the books, you know, a lot of people who do it, when we teach classes, we tell people to use a ladle and a funnel. And that works. That works just fine. But I'm not real crazy about it myself. So I will do one this way, and then I'll show you what I normally do. I need to add a little bit more. And once you fill the jar, there's a couple of things. If you get experienced, you pretty much know where a quarter inch is. But if you're trying to measure it because you're not at that place yet, you can put this handy dandy little measuring device on there and you can see, can you see from this angle that it's not touching the, the jelly? So that means that that jar needs a little bit more. So you can get pretty good at judging your, um, your head space, which is, that's what it's called, and different, different products require a different head space. And for jam and jelly, it's a quarter inch. I'm going to put this over here. Now, I have found that I do just fine doing it this way. If you're careful, you don't end up with a big mess. And for me, it's faster. Okay, when we get down to the end, there is enough there probably for a four ounce jar if I went and got one. But what you can also do with it is you can fill a jar that you're not going to process that you're going to keep in the refrigerator and eat right away. And that works just fine too. You only need to process the stuff that you want to be able to store. If you're going to eat it tomorrow, it doesn't need to be processed. So this will get eaten right away. We'll set it over here and it will probably set up by the time we finish processing the jars. Now, one of the things they tell you to do, I don't think I'm going to have a problem here with any of these. They tell you to get rid of air bubbles, but as you can see, this stuff is really pretty liquid and the fruit is pretty well distributed. So I'm not thinking that I really have air bubbles to worry about here. The other thing is, at this point in time, is you go around and did you measure right? Or do we need more? And you know what? If it's coming up short, like that one is, that is where this jar that you're going to eat tomorrow comes in really handy. So, you could do that, and you can go like that, bring it right up to where it needs to be. Maybe there won't be any for tomorrow, other than the phone. Okay. Now, we want to make sure we have a good seal on our jars, and one of the ways we do that is by ensuring that the top of the jar is clean all the way around. So that's what our wet paper towel is good for. Because if you have jam that's up there on the top, it will mess with your seal. And that is not a good thing ever. So our next thing is your rings and the lids, the two part rings and the lids, uh, used to, you used to have to, uh, boil the lids. This, in this, the new lids do not need that. They are 
They have a seal around the edge that will do a good job just through the processing. So we put the lids on, we put the rings on, and the rings, we turn them finger tight. And that is old lady grandma finger tight, not big strong grandson finger tight. And we'll take our jars over and we'll set them in the seat. Make sure that the water is in the steam canner is just up to the um, shelf, and it is. And then we put the lid on. Now, in the boiling water bath, you start counting time for the processing when all the water with the jars in it comes to a boil. With a steam canner, we wait until the indicator on the top gets over into the green zone and then we can start counting our time. So we have to wait until it comes up to temperature before we can start counting our 10 minutes. Then we will count our 10 minutes to finish processing our jars. Okay, so our steam canner has gotten into the green zone, which means that we can start counting time now. So I'm gonna set my timer on 10 minutes and we're gonna let it go until we hear the ding and then we will turn off the fire. What we will do after that is leave it alone for five minutes. And that is to let everything in the jar settle and not to do it. Because at this point in time, we want to make sure we do not disturb the jars in the seals. We want them to, to make a good contact and a good seal. After five minutes of waiting, then I will show you how to remove the jars from the uh, canner. And they will sit on the countertop and not be molested for 24 hours. That way we will make sure we, we have the best chance at a good seal. Okay, so our timer is done. And what we need to do now is take the top off and turn the fire off. And we just leave our jars alone for five, at least five minutes. You can leave them longer than that. And when we have passed our five minute mark, then we will move them out of this pan and put them over there and they will sit there for 24 hours and not be disturbed. So I'm gonna set the timer again for another five minutes. So it's been five minutes and our jars have had time to settle. And so now I'm gonna move them off of the stove so they'll be out of the way and let them sit for 24 hours. That way we can make sure we get a good seal on all the jars and that everything that's inside the jar is as safe as I can possibly make it. So remove our jars. This is a jar lifter, and it's a really handy tool to have. You grab a hold, and you lift straight up, and then you go over to where you are and let go. It's important not to slosh your jars around. If you slosh them around, you can really mess up the seal, and that's not a good thing. So you just lift them straight up, especially if you're doing this with a water bath canner where you need to go down in. You need to practice going down in and coming back out while keeping the jar perpendicular. Sideways jar is bad. And there we have it. The recipe said it made eight cups. We had eight cups plus a little bit left over. That will, get go, will go on my toast tomorrow morning. And we have eight jars of strawberry jam. Low sugar strawberry jam. One thing I will tell you, we always recommend that you use a product within one year, and it's really important to do that with the low sugar because it has a shorter shelf life than the higher sugar jam. But it will be good for that amount of time, and you probably won't have any trouble using that because it is really good. So thank you very much for making jam with me today, and happy canning. Colleen, your your mic's off, hon. Yep, it is off. Well, I oh. hope everybody enjoyed that. Uh, thank you for that demonstration, Linda. That was very informative. Uh, I, think, I, think we, I think we lost a little bit at the beginning, so we want to tell them about our taste test and why we did low sugar. 
Okay, yes. Uh, Linda did a taste test and you did what, five? We had five different kinds of strawberry jam. We had the low sugar. We had no sugar. We had regular freezer, uh, regular strawberry jam, and then the low sugar strawberry jam. Is that five? We had five different ones. Mm -hmm. And all the people that came to the workshop voted on which one they thought tasted the best and the low sugar strawberry jam won the contest hands down. Right. And that's because you get more of the fruit flavor. Mm -hmm. I, I like the, uh, the freezer jam as well. The strawberry freezer jam. It's, it's one that I like. Um, so I hope everybody learned something from that. It was very interesting. Uh, I want to talk uh, in just a moment about other uses for that extra jam that you have. But before we do, I have, I want to share something with you. Okay, this is, come on, there we go. This is how many, what you need, quantity and yield for berries. So this is of course approximation. Two pounds of fresh berries will yield approximately a quart of frozen or canned. One quart of fresh berries yields approximately a cup of juice or two cups of mashed berries. A 36 pound crate yields 18 to 24 quarts. 12 pounds of berries are needed to fill seven quarts for canning and eight pounds of fresh berries are needed to fill nine pints for canning. So that kind of gives you an idea of how much fresh berries, if, what you buy and how much you'll get out of it for whatever you're going to make. Now today we're talking about some frozen berries and I found that a four pound bag will make a eight jars of, ju of uh, berry jam and I have a, a cup of juice with some berries left over. So I was able to get my four pound bag at Costco. And I like, I like this one because it's raspberries, blueberries, and blackberries. Um, I bought a bag at the grocery store and it had uh, blueberries, ra uh, blackberries, and strawberries. So generally, wherever you buy your frozen berries, the mixture can be different. It's not all the same. So you just find one that you like. Uh, berries or berries are berries. So if you're using a, a, like this, the mixed berry recipe, you can use any mixed berries that you have. You can either make your own or you can uh, make your own. Okay, so that's, that's something to keep in mind. All right, let me stop the share on this. And we're gonna talk about things that we have made with our frozen berry or our berry jam. Now, um, I also made some of this with store-bought jam. Uh, I have a daughter who doesn't like the seeds in berry jam. So I went and bought a jar of seedless jam. Diana, you found these recipes. You want to talk about them a little bit? Sure. This is what we have here. Um, the, uh, what was this one called? Hand pies. Hand pies. Um, that's a ball recipe. And uh, ball tends to sometimes put recipes up on their website and then almost as quickly they take them down. And so we just were lucky enough to come across the, that recipe and had it printed out before they took it <laughs> off their website. So that's one that Colleen really experimented with. She used berries initially. I know you did some with apples. I did some with apples. Um, I did a mixture of berries and apples. Uh, and that crust, uh, the crust on that is really amazing. Yes, um, I think you could easily use that for a regular pie. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's really versatile. Very flaky, mm -hmm. very good. Now the uh, cookie bars were one that uh, I just happened to come across. 
uh, I don't recall what website it was uh, from, um, but we looked at that and we thought we would play around with it a little bit. And so we discovered that this recipe right here works great on almost any kind of jam. And uh, we even discovered that it works really well with that chocolate raspberry topping that you also will get the recipe for. Um, it does not impart a lot of the chocolate flavor into this. You definitely get the raspberries. And so it's another way to use this chocolate raspberry topping uh, that you may not have thought about. The, both of these recipes, I think, are recipes that you can play around with. You can adjust them a little bit to suit your family. Um, if your family really likes strawberry, I would definitely give this one a try. Um, what did you find that you liked the best in there? Um, this is apricot, um, and I that's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. So I think you can experiment with it, and you certainly, as, as Colleen had said earlier, can use some store-bought jam even. If, right. if you don't have any that you homemade, uh, you could certainly use it for that. You'll get both of those recipes uh -huh. um, when uh, you get your packet uh, in the, um, when they send out the, the copies of the videos. Right, right. Um, oh, and the barbecue <laughs> sauce. This is it called Berry Licious Barbecue Sauce. And uh, this is also from the ball site. Also one of those that they kept up for just a short amount of time and pulled it down. I don't know why they did that because this is some of the best barbecue right. sauce. The base of it is a bar, uh, a bottle, a jar of a your triple stars. berry jam. Mm -hmm. So it's got a, the jam as your base. It's got some tomato paste and tomato sauce and whatnot in it. And everybody that we've asked about um, has loved this. We, I personally, we've used it on chicken and pork. It was excellent. Colleen, what did you do? I, got, I had it on pork chops and I, and it's a nice dipping sauce as well. Yeah, you notice it's thick. It really sticks to whatever meat you're going to use it on. And one of the things that we did with ours is we had some sliced pork and we used a small amount of it, of it with mayonnaise and put it on the sandwich. And it really yes. added to that sandwich. So I think that uh, you're gonna love this. This, my husband, in fact, said, we wanna make this again and again. It is not cannibal, but you can freeze it. Mm -hmm. So okay. it does make a quart or so of it, mm -hmm. um, maybe too much, even though you, you'll be keeping it in the refrigerator, it might be too much for your family. Don't hesitate to freeze it and then pull it out when you do need it. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and this has a little bit of cayenne in it, so you can adjust <laughs> the heat uh, to your liking. So this is, this is another recipe you're going to get from us today. Um, you're, we're also going to give you the chocolate raspberry sauce topping. So um, you'll get these recipes and also a recipe to make uh, the mixed berry jam, uh, which we got off the Sure Gel website. So, but I want to recommend to you that whichever brand of pectin you use, you use the recipe that's in that box. So if you're using a powdered pectin or the liquid pectin, use whatever is in that box. Um, do we have any questions? I'm not seeing questions, Colleen, but I think it would be good to talk about the reason, the reason why you use the amount of sugar that is called for in the recipe. Because I think a lot of people want to cut sugar thinking it's just too much, but there is a science reason for it. Right, right. And that has to do with the, uh, the preserving of your, your jam or your jelly that you're making, or actually anything. The, when a recipe calls for a particular amount of sugar, uh, that's, it, it's been scientifically tested and that's what you need. It's just like if you were making uh, if you were using, uh, if you were making pickles or something and you were using vinegar and salt, those quantities are there to preserve. If you don't use the correct amount of sugar, then your 
your preservation, you've lost some of that. And that's when you're going to get some mold and, and maybe some botulism. Right. So, it, and, so. and the reason for that is because the, the sugar and the salt and the vinegar that are the most common things we use when we're preserving bind up the water so that it's not available to the to the uh, organisms that, yeah. that make us sick. And so if you cut down on that, even though, even if you're making the regular sugar and it sounds like, oh my God, you want four cups of fruit and you want eight cups of sugar, that sounds like way too much, but it is not because that's how much you need to make it safe. Right. If, if it's too, if it's too much sugar for you, you can always get the low sugar and then go with the, the no sugar parts. Um, as long as you follow the recipe. Yes, follow the recipe. Also, there is a brand of uh, pectin called Pomona, and it is um, it is it is different than than uh, something I've showed you here. And that one is done with uh, calcium as a preservation, and so you can change the amount of sugar. That has a much lower uh, shelf life and also much lower uh, once it's opened, that shelf life. So I would, if you do that, I would recommend using the, uh, the four ounce jars, depending on how many people you have in your family. And you can find that, uh, I know Amazon has it. I've seen it in a few uh, grocery stores or health food stores, you can try there. But uh, generally speaking, I, I just prefer to go with the, with the low sugar. Um, trying to think if there was anything else. Have, once somebody asked, have you used the reusable canning lids? I have not. No. Um, I have used them in the freezer, but not in canning. Um, I'm, oh, they're, they're not. Here, here's, yeah, here's another one that says, um, you re recommended not making double batches. Can we make half batches? And the answer to that is a good solid no. No, no. Make, make your batch, can it up, or if you don't want to can it, if you want to process it in a canner, put it in the freezer. Yeah. You know, that, that works as well. If you know you you can't cut it or double it. If you have a basically, if you have a recipe that is intended to be canned and sh shelf stable, don't mess with that recipe. If you mess with it, it now becomes something that goes in the freezer or for immediate consumption in your refrigerator. Right, right. Uh, I saw there um, somebody wanted to know about adding lavender. Um, there are recipes for uh, lavender and strawberry and other things. I would look for the recipe instead of just trying on my own. Um, spices, you can, you can add, but um, because lavender is you have, I, I would find it not safe just to throw in some lavender in my, um, my strawberry jam. But if you go to the ball website, which is fresh, freshpreserving.com, um, yeah, um, Diana found a couple. They have a lavender apricot jam, a lavender apricot lemon, apricot lemon lavender uh, marmalade, marinade, excuse me, marinade. So I think you just have to, to look around at some uh, approved recipes. Oh, and, Pauline, yes. talk, talk a little bit, bit about how somebody knows whether or not it's a, an approved recipe. How do, how do we decide? What how do we decide? We decide because they are not, it's not approved because it's on Facebook or Pinterest or something like that. Research-based recipes come from universities. 
So um, one of the handouts that, that we're going to send you a link to is the Washington State University Extension. And it's, I got this one wet, but uh, it's got all the methods that I talked about today. Uh, Penn State has approved recipes. Uh, the National Center for Home Food Preservation, Ball, ball uh, their fresh uh, preserving. So it needs to be um, researched by a university or uh, somebody that, a company that deals with canning supplies. I was impressed, Colleen, I, and I'm sure you were too when we had our presentations in our trainings by um, the state microbiologist that, that helps with our trainings. Yes. When she talked about what was involved in testing a recipe, it's not just making it once, it's making it hundreds it's, of times. Uh, and yes. then opening the jars and testing what's inside the jars to see if there's any bacteria or other organisms in the jars. And, and the whole process, I think she said, because you have to hire a, a lab uh, post yes. a, a <clears throat> person who's working on their doctorate or something to work as a lab assistant to do it and everything. And I think it was like $50,000, something like that. Something like that, yes. To test a recipe. So it's not just, I, oh, I've made this 20 times in my kitchen. It's, right. it's or, really tested. Or this, you know, this was grandma's recipe. I, you know, when I was a kid, I helped my grandmother can. We put pectin on the top to seal. Uh, uh, paraffin. Yeah, uh, paraffin, yeah, paraffin, it's not pectin. Um, paraffin on the top. It, you know, it just was completely different um, when you were doing the pickling and stuff like that. The vinegar acidity is different from what it used to be. I bought a jar or a bottle of cleaning vinegar the other day, and it is higher acidity than the vinegar, the white vinegar, or the other vinegars that I have that I use for com consumption. So, and it says on the bottle, it's not for eating, it's for cleaning. So make sure that you are using the newest and the best resources so you keep your, your family and yourself safe. You know, people say, well, you know, it hasn't killed somebody yet, but do you wanna take that chance? And the answer to that to me is no. And if I have a problem with something I've made, Maybe I'm not sure, maybe I didn't, I did something wrong and I, re I realized it afterwards. I don't wanna throw this away, but you know what? It's not a child, it's not family. I, I can empty my jar in the garbage. And so I've, I've kind of wasted my time and maybe a little bit of money, but I don't have to worry about making somebody sick and I know that it's safe and the quality is good. So as long as you follow your recipes, do what it says, then you're, you're in good shape. And, and remember, if you do too much, um, you make too much like I always do, I now know what to do to use up some of that. Diana, is there anything else that you can think of? Linda? No, I don't think so. I think we're good. I um, Another way to get rid of the extras is I drive around, especially during the holiday season, with a box in my car. And everybody I visit gets to pick a jar. So I, I, give, I, mean, away, I, I give away a lot of stuff that way. Yeah. Because and, when the next year comes, you want to make it again. Oh, I know. And I was just checking my shelves. We're coming into canning season again. And I still have several jars of plum jelly and plum jam and stuff up there. And I was thinking, okay, I think I maybe need to make some of those cookies, <laughs> those hand pies and, and distribute the wealth. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and with these, even though they are, the recipe specifies berry, use your imagination. I'm thinking plums would be pretty good in those hand pies. And of course I love peaches. Yeah. 
And these freeze well. Ah. Very well. The hand pie recipe makes eight, um, but in the, the, the bars, uh, an eight by eight pan. Yeah, uh, I did find with the, with the bars that if I lined my pan with um, parchment, I could just pull them out because it sticks. It likes to stick around the edge and I could never get it greased enough so it didn't. So if I line my pan with parchment, I can just lift them up and then I refrigerate them to cut them. I thought that was easier. Okay. So, okay. All right. Well, I, I don't see any additional questions. So I think that we're, uh, we're in pretty good shape and, and okay. we, we got to, um, we didn't run all the way up to 12, which is fine. Yeah. I think we covered, covered what we had to do, unless you have something else. Anybody, anybody have any more questions that you'd like to ask? Okay. I'm not seeing any more. So okay. I'm, I'm thinking that we can, we can call it. All right. All right. Well, thank you for attending. I hope we've given you some ideas today. And, yes. uh, yeah. And one last question. Yes, we will be sending out the video link.